I hope you're enjoying your class today. Today we're trying to give you here at the Veterans Memorial Center a picture of an American time in military history that's often called the Forgotten War, the war in Korea. The war itself took place from 1950 until 1952. But we want to set the stage because it also became a war that America has fought in that kind of new way uh, since 1950. Uh, many of your great-grandparents were uh, involved in World War II. Uh, up till that point, the biggest war in American history besides the Civil War, and certainly was many more people involved worldwide than in the Civil War. But the World War II set a stage for a whole new world that was moving very quickly when World War II ended in uh, uh, September 2nd, 1945, when the Japanese signed the peace treaty uh, on the decks of the USS Missouri in Tokyo Bay, Japan. Uh, what I'd like to do is, using this world map, give you a focus of where we are and where the events that we'll describe today took place. Uh, first of all, here, here in Florida, literally halfway across the world, and we're going to talk today about the Korean War, a tiny peninsula, uh, often called the Hidden Kingdom because of the peninsula and geography, always fought between China and Russia and Japan. In terms of the, uh, uh, in terms of how the area worked, in culturally and historically, my name is Don Weaver. I'm here today as a, an Army veteran. I served in Korea for a year. Doug Bissett, who you meet later, also an Army veteran. He served in Korea for a year. So we we have the experience after the war was com was over. Nevertheless, the peace treaty was never signed. We are not at peace with North Korea. We'll describe more of that later. Uh, at this point, remember that when World War II ended, there was a huge shift in, in uh, the whole world. Communism, which had begun in 1917 in Russia, began to take over all of uh, Eastern Europe, began to infiltrate, and within three years, uh, the communists of China, who had battled a democratic regime called the Kuomintang, they had won out in China forcing the Kuomintang to move offshore of China into what's now called Taiwan, the island of Formosa. So that the communism was all over the place, as it were. Well, one of the impacts of that was that after the war, uh, in the occupation, American and UN forces had gone into uh, South Korea and decided, well, we better set up a sort of a demarcation that that part of Korea at least would not fall to the communists. But North Korea, uh, which to this day remains probably the most totalitarian state in the world, and we'll talk a lot more about North Korea as we go, um, and still exists today, is, uh, uh, is uh, located to the north, right on the border with China, which gave the North Koreans, if as long as the Chinese support them, and the Russians from time to time support them, gave North Korea much more power than a small country like that should have had. In addition to the problem that we had in the Pacific Ocean, remember in the Atlantic side, in Europe, uh, the, the Soviet Union, then in force again since 1917, began to annex a whole series of countries in Eastern Europe and actually uh, in an agreement reached late in World War II uh, with America and the other allies, British, French, they decided to uh, cut off Berlin, which had been a major uh, uh, foothold for all the Allies, the former capital of Nazi Germany. So they tried to do that in 1948. The United States responded by a massive airlift and ended that. So Berlin, again, locked back down. But for decades, East Germany, West Germany were two separate places, just like North Korea and South Korea with a starch border in between. Communists on one side and democratic uh, groups and forces and capitalism on the other side. So this is what's happening and during the, the build up to 1950. Secretly in 1950, and we'll launch right now into the, into the uh, war effort, but I just want to tell you that when you th think about this module and the and Korea war, Korean War, think about our museum at Brevard Veterans Memorial Center right behind the Merritt Square Mall. 
Take time with your parents, with friends. Come out on the weekends. We're open every day of the week and the weekends. We'll be open all summer. There's a nice exhi exhibit on the Korean War and many of the other conflict histories of the United States. It's a 6,000 square foot museum. Lots to see. So we hope you'll come out and, and understand more about American military history. Again, this module is a part of our Veterans uh, Back to Class program in coordination with the Joe Foss Institute. So I hope you enjoy the rest of it. I'll turn it over now to Doug Bissett. Doug, take it away. Thank you, Don. I'm going to take you, I'm going to take you through the, uh, the actual period of the battles that took place during the Korean War. And it's interesting that it was um, uh, four, four phases, essentially, all that took place, essentially, in the first year. And then after that, it was just a stalemate. But uh, I should zero in on the geography so you get a sense of what we're dealing with here. Here's a better, a much bigger map of Korea itself, uh, China being to the north and the Soviet Union. Um, and China, the China border was, was bisected by the uh, Yalu River. Okay, and uh, then as, as Don mentioned, the, there, was, there's a, there was a split between, after World War II, there was a split between North Korea and South Korea, North Korea being controlled by the communists and South Korea being controlled by, we'll call it a democratic society. Um, Pyongyang is the capital of North Korea and Seoul is the capital of South Korea, okay? Um, and Incheon is also going to be talked about in a minute, uh, which is just on the, on the, uh, the yellow sea side of Seoul. Now, the important thing to remember is that it's like a big peninsula, Japan being down here, okay, a big peninsula. And what was particularly interesting geographically was that the peninsula is really bisected by the Taibak Mountains. And I have some photographs here that shows you how rugged the mountains were. They were up to 9,000 feet high. Uh, I took these pictures in 1970s so you get some sense of what, what they were dealing with when we were fighting the war. So it really bisected the country uh, east and west. Uh, and I'll talk to that a little more, but that's important to keep in mind. Also, the southern part of Korea was agrarian in nature. And there's, as you can see from this photograph, a lot of rice paddies, et cetera, that work that worked their way up to the mountain areas in the, in the middle of the of the of the peninsula. So that and then the southern part of uh, of the Korean Peninsula is Pusan, which is the main port in the uh, in the in the whole country of this of South South Korea. And it's important to remember that name because that's uh, one of the key points and key uh, key bases that we talk about. Okay, as I mentioned, it really essentially the the war was four phases, and the first phase was uh, when Kim Il-sung, who was the communist leader in North Korea, decided that he was going to invade the South and try to unify the country. And that started in the summer of 1950. Uh, fortunately, we had uh, General MacArthur and the 8th Army, uh, which was a very scaled down version of occupation troops in Japan, which is just off South, South Korea, so that there was the ability to react quickly. Unfortunately, the troops that he had and stuff were, this was five years after the war and they were, for the most part, untrained, etc. The theory that Kim Il-sung had was to invade South Korea as quickly as possible, take the whole country, unify the country under communist rule, and kick everybody out so that we didn't have a chance to react. But fortunately, um, General MacArthur, who was in charge in, in Japan, threw through, uh, through our troops into the, we'll call it into the breach essentially, and slowed, slowed down the progress of the North Koreans as they moved south uh, on the western side of the Taibak Mountains to the Pusan area. Um, the, the Pusan area uh, it wound up being that the Allied forces, as time went on, we built up troops and built up capability, and uh, we held we held the line here in a circle around Pusan, and that was the last foothold that we had before we got pushed out into the sea, but they never took it. So that's, that stalemate uh, persisted uh, for that period of time. Then phase two started, and this was the brilliance of General Douglas MacArthur. Um, 
he did what would what normally would be called an end around. He brought Marine Corps and naval forces back around the peninsula and invaded in Incheon here, right at this spot, which is just west of Seoul, the capital of Korea. Okay, and what, what took place was that um, they had 57 LSTs and 260 ships. They brought the 1st Marine Division that stormed the shore. What was so particularly unique, and the North Koreans never expected an invasion from that point, was that um, geographically, Incheon has 30-foot uh, tides. It's the second highest in the world. And so if you look at the Incheon landing maps here, it shows the invasion forces coming in to uh, what was the high mountain of the island there called Wamido, and then a, the port city of Incheon itself. The Marine Corps stormed ashore, used ladders to get up the, the dikes and stuff during the tides. The tides being so strong that what happened was if you switch to this uh, beach photograph, you can see the LSTs that are stranded on, in the mud uh, at low tide. So the big concern was that you get your initial troops ashore during the first tide, but then the tide goes out and you can't get anybody else in again until the second tide. But fortunately, the North Koreans were taken, taken off, uh, off their guard, and so they, they had enough troops to hold them until they got the rest of their forces ashore. Now this down here is an example of an LST beached in there and how much tide there is. I'm not sure how much you can get of that, but it gives an example of what we're talking about. LSTs were called LSTs landing ship tank. That's a big Navy ship that has all the supplies and the troops, drops the ramps down, it's shallow drafted, and then they go ashore. So what happened was with the, with the success of that incursion into Incheon, they're basically, if you look back at this map, basically cuts off the North Koreans from their supply lines. Because um, what happened was that we, that we then marched and fought our way into Seoul, Korea and took Seoul, Korea back, which is, again, the, the capital of South Korea. So this is the second invasion of Seoul, Korea. There are a total of four times that the capital of South Korea was taken over. So it got totally devastated in the end. So the supply lines got cut off and it was essentially the collapse of the of the North Korean troops uh, because they had to, had to run and get back to the north side before they got captured. Many did get captured. So what, what happened by October was that the UN General Assembly uh, recommended that there be a unification uh, effort from, uh, uh, from in South, uh, South and North Korea and, uh, gave, and President Truman gave MacArthur authorization to move to move north from Seoul and, and the middle of the middle of the country to unify the entire country under UN control. I recognize as the stepping back a second, this is a UN effort. There were 17 countries involved in, in the war in Korea, which is the first time that had ever taken place, the uh, United Nations. Now MacArthur had, uh, had assured the President Truman that China would not enter the conflict, and if they did, Air power would slaughter them in a month. Well, what happened in, in the next phase was that uh, um, MacArthur then, his troops all marched into North, in, past the 38th parallel, which is where this all started, and then moved up and took, took Pyongyang, which is the, the capital of North Korea, and then marched on, mar fought on its way into Unsan and then up to along the uh, Yalu River. On, um, and close to China. Now, China had warned the United States that it would attack UN forces if it moved north of the 38th parallel. So there was always that threat, and Truman and, and the United States and um, allies uh, told MacArthur that, uh, that uh, they didn't, they didn't want to get them involved in, in the war, uh, and, uh, but he, he kept on moving north, and. So that precipitated the next phase, next phase of the battle. Now, um, what happened was that the Chinese started moving in into North Korea after um, after MacArthur's troops had gotten up to that 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 point in time up in the Hunan area. So the first battle took place 
with Chinese troops in Hunam, right, right at this location. And they poured in, three divisions snuck in at night and camouflaged and they, they, they caught, caught MacArthur's troops off guard mm -hmm. and started, started a, a massive retreat. Um, it also took place over on the right-hand side of the Tybeck Mountains. Now, uh, MacArthur had moved north in, in, two, in two efforts because of the mountain ranges, as I mentioned earlier, on the left-hand side of the mountain ranges to, through Pyongyang to the Un Unsan area. The, the Eighth Army, the Army guys were basically there, uh, moved up on that side of the mountains. So on the right-hand side of the mountains, they brought in a Marine Corps and a Navy effort, did an amphibious landing in Hugnam, and moved on up into the to the uh, Chosin Reservoir area of North Korea. And that's about as far as they got before the Chinese poured in uh, from the north. Now, essentially, the, uh, what, happened, what happened to the Marine Corps got trapped up in here in this very mountainous, uh, very mountainous area. And, uh, they held out. They held out against the Chinese onslaught, uh, but but started a uh, what they call a retrograde action, which is essentially a treat a retreat in force, uh, moved their way down to Hungnam Harbor, and and got evacuated from there. Um, this um, I'll show you this book later called Breakout. But essentially, it was horrendous weather. It was freezing temperatures below 50 degrees. The Chosin Reservoir was just a horrible place to fight, um, but they eventually got evacuated at Hungnam Harbor uh, by the Navy, which was a 60-mile march for the Marine Corps. Uh, 193 ships were involved. They evacuated 100,000 military and 17,000 vehicles, 91,000 re refugees, and then they wasted the port. They just blew it up uh, on the retreat back south. So this setback at this point, the Chinese are pouring south and uh, moving the setback uh, at that point. It was also considered by the U.S. that uh, in, in using nuclear weapons, tactical nuclear weapons against the Chinese or the North Koreans, but that was rejected by the Allies as not a good move. Well, phase three, uh, the, the Chinese pushed all the way down to Osan. So in other words, they took Seoul again, the capital, that's the third time now it got wasted, and moved down to Osan, 30 miles south of Seoul. Osan was where they were basically held in check. Okay, um, in phase four, well, a new commander came into being, and that was General Matthew Ridgway, and he started, launched a new offensive on, in February 22nd to April 4th of the next year. Um, the capital city of Seoul was retaken, and they pushed, basically pushed the Chinese and the North Koreans back to essentially where we had started in the first place, roughly the 38th parallel. So this was the fourth time that, this, that the capital city of Seoul had been wiped out. Um, by June of 51, there was a total stalemate, and uh, uh, basically this went on uh, for quite some time, but there was an agreement to hold a ceasefire discussions um, um, and to uh, and to uh, start talking, talking peace. But Chairman Mao, who's in charge of the Chinese uh, government, uh, uh, did, did not want to end the war. So the talks went on, ongoing negotiations for two more years, essentially, fighting in that general area uh, for that period of time, pushing back and forth, grabbing real estate, but getting nowhere. So two more years. The war went on till 53. Uh, they could not agree on handling prisoners. They could not agree on a lot of things. But what really precipitated the end of the war was in March 1953, Joseph Stalin died. So they no longer, uh, the Soviets voted to end the war. And so the Chinese and North Koreans no longer had the support of the Soviets and their equipment, both their air power and, and, uh, and their uh, advisors and everything else that they did in getting involved in it. So Mao started to, uh, to talk peace, and they uh, came up with uh, voluntary repatriation, and there was exchange of sick and POWs. Uh, and as Don mentioned earlier, there was never any real peace treaty signed. It was just a stalemate. Um, and they established the demilitarized zone 
the DMZ, you've heard this before, maybe you've heard it uh, in the past on the news, the DMZ was this demilitarized zone that's 2.5 mile buffer zone um, that's 160 miles wide that's basically roughly in the 38th parallel there. So that's what's established today. We're still there in force. So one other thing that I wanted to point out Okay, we're over on the right-hand side of, of the library, and I just wanted to point out a couple of, of the air power weapons that, that took place during Kore the Korean War. Korean War was, for the most part, was a ground, a ground grunt uh, battle, but we fortunately we had control of the air and the seas. And, uh, and these are two cases, these are two examples of models that are in the museum that you can come and see. Uh, and it also particularly interesting was that Korea was the first time that we introduced jet airplanes uh, to the war because World War II never had uh, jets. So there's F-4 uh, Corsair, which is which is the latter part of uh, World War II was was used, uh, and it is a propeller-driven plane, but uh, it was great with rockets and close-in assault uh, that they use effectively in Korea as well. And then <clears throat> the second example is a Grumman VF-115 jet bomber. As you can see, it, it is a jet. A jet. Um, over here, I have a picture of aircraft carrier Essex because many of the airplanes that were used were flying off of, off of aircraft carriers. The Essex, interestingly enough, has both the propeller-driven airplanes here on the left-hand side of the deck and uh, jet airplanes on the right-hand side of the deck. So you get a sense of how things were lined up on an aircraft carrier during the Korean War. And you can see they had supply ships and fuel ships that were, um, that were supporting the aircraft carrier. Just one other point. Uh, we are in the library. There are 6,000 books here. So if you have any particular interest in pursuing any of our subjects that we talk about, uh, I strongly recommend if you like uh, the Korean War discussion, this, this book called Breakout by Martin Rus, uh, which was uh, my favorite, uh, the Marines in their, in their disengagement with the Chinese up in that frozen Chosin Reservoir. I'm going to now turn this back over to Don for a wrap up on, on the uh, aftermath of the Korean War. Thank you, Doug. That was a really nice survey of the war, that complicated war uh, in Korea that still is not technically over. I'll mention before I start talking about the modern day Korea, I'll mention that uh, two things. Number one, you have to think of Korea like Florida. It's a peninsula. Imagine if the northern part of Florida from Orlando to the north was run by a communist country and Orlando was the capital. Imagine if Tampa was the capital of the southern part and Tampa south was run by a democratic government like we have now. You can imagine how many families were split up, how many people lost their lives in this war, the innocent civilians. And to this day, thousands of North Koreans die of starvation every winter because they're operated under a totalitarian communist government. And we, need, we can't forget those kinds of facts. Well, let's look at Korea during the war that Doug described. Just like you've seen pictures in World War II, it was devastation everywhere. This is a picture from Seoul, the capital of South Korea. And uh, this is soul of today. If you have driven with your parents any kind of vehicles like uh, Hyundai and, and uh, what are the other cars? Kia. Kia. Uh, you've had a Samsung player. You've had a TV from Samsung. LG. LG, mm -hmm. LG is the newest. The cell phones. And Korea is the largest builder today of major ships. They build larger and better ships than any country in the world. And they always give credit to the soldiers who served during the war and even after the war. They invite American soldiers to come to their country and give a tour. They award medals. Many of uh, our colleagues who fought in Korea have received medals. And uh, just appreciation that without the United States leading that UN effort, and by the way, remember the UN was brand new that time. It was, had hardly done anything meaningful and because it wasn't established until after World War II was over. The League of Nations had failed miserably after World War I, so the United Nations was just getting going. Uh, I also want to, if we can zero in one more time, 
to look at this dramatically. This is a picture taken by satellite at night over the Korean Peninsula just a few years ago. South Korea lit up, vibrant, people smiling, enjoying life, contributing to an economy that's uh, in the top seven in the whole world. North Korea, equal in size, only Pyongyang has any hint of a little bit of light. And that light is controlled by the government, by the elites. A hundred people run North Korea, uh, military mostly, and, and they control everything. They control everybody's lives. So it's, um, I think, a credit to the United States and the other UN partners that the war was fought. It should not be forgotten. And we should remember that at this point in time, uh, we have to hold the line at certain places. And the DMZ of Korea was that line to hold. Hopefully in your lifetime, the Koreans will be reunited. They're a vibrant, industrious people. Um, they are really uh, the, the, the uh, middle kingdom, but a cultural history that is fantastic. So that's, the, that's where we are in Korea now. At this point, I'd like Doug to talk a little bit more about the uh, um, uh, situation. Well, let me finish with the world first. <laughs> Sorry, my mistake. Uh, what happened after Korea? If you look back in history from 1953, and when the armistice was signed, no peace treaty, just an agreement to stop fighting, uh, hundreds of Americans and South Korean personnel have been killed in combat operations in Korea since then. When I was in Korea from 1968, uh, 1969 to 70, we had the murder of uh, uh, five Americans were killed by a um, uh, North Korean infiltration team while they were working in the DMZ. Uh, so the war has not stopped for certain military people. But look what happened in the rest of the world. By 1991, communism in every place else but China and North Korea and Cuba and a few other places had fallen when the Soviet Union collapsed. Because let's face it, if anybody had a real choice, if any human being would choose how to live, it wouldn't be under communist rule. It wouldn't be under radical socialist rule. Because the government determines everything. And the government dictates to you everything you do, where you'll go to school or whether you'll go to school, and what you'll do as your career or what you won't do as your career. And so it's, it's, it's important to note that. So the main thing that thrust upon the world, though, in my opinion, and you can compare this in different books and everything, is that with Korea, the United States adopted a new mentality. There did not have to be a total war victory, a vanquishing of the country responsible for attacking us like had happened in Germany, Italy, and Japan in World War II. That hasn't happened again. The other big thing is that Korea proved that we could fight a war and still meet major objectives, although there were many that had hoped we had gone forward and, and vanquished the Chinese when they were relatively weak. And now, as I know you all understand in today's news, China is probably the number one global adversary of the United States, United States in terms of military, uh, geographic, uh, um, business interests, and cybercrime. Uh, China is, uh, is probably our most significant challenge today. Um, so what, what goes on then, and here your grandfather uh, may have served in Vietnam. And that was, again, a war that it was, it was decided we would go in, but we would have rules of engagement that wouldn't completely destroy the enemy, like we eventually did with Germany, Italy, and Japan in World War II. So uh, we ended up withdrawing from Vietnam, but there are still blessings to be had. Our, our courage to fight there ended up putting in a government that is neither pro-Chinese nor pro-Russian, but very much Vietnamese in their approach. And many Americans go to Vietnam as tourists these days and enjoy it. And some of the things you buy were made in Vietnam. Like Korea, they aren't at the level of Korea, but they're doing a lot more things. If we skip ahead and to the wars that we see with, with the, in between, you have the Gulf Wars. First, when we threw the Iraqis out of Kuwait, once that mission was solved, we stopped the war. That was 1990-91. Uh, then, when uh, it was decided uh, after 9-11, when the terrorists attacked us in uh, New York, in Washington, 
on the, uh, on the uh, landscape of Pennsylvania when a plane went down. You all know the story from our earlier classes about 9-11 and the aftermath. Those wars are still ongoing. Afghanistan at 19 years is the longest war in American history. But we're fighting with limited objectives. Our objective is not to take over, control, dominate. And I, I, one thing that makes me very proud to be a former Army uh, person and, a, and a, an American, and I hope does you too, uh, since the 1800s, the United States has never fought a war and seized permanently an inch of territory. It's always been given back to the people who fought. Who are our biggest allies now, for example? Japan, Germany, Italy. We all, we help rebuild those countries after the war. We're doing the same thing we're trying in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Yemen, in all the places now that terrorism had taken root and attacked us yet again. So it's a whole new definition of how we fight our battles and what our objectives are. But I want to thank, uh, thank your parents and your grandparents and your great-grandparents because we here at the Veterans Memorial Center we believe firmly that without veterans, we don't have an America to, to, to deal with. And sadly, every once in a while, a war comes up and the civil civilian leadership of our country directs our soldiers, sailors, airmen, marine, coast guardsmen, and space force to go forward into combat. Okay, Doug, you want to take it over on your, your uh, personal experiences? Sure. Thank you, Don. We decided we would talk a little bit about uh, what we did when we were in Korea, since both of us were pretty much there at the same time. I just have a couple of photographs that I took at the time to help explain exactly what I did. I was a uh, first lieutenant transportation officer, 23 years old. Here I am behind my desk. I had a desk job. Well, we, we basically ran the port of Incheon, the military port of Incheon, in, in a transportation mode. So uh, our job was to support the 8th Army troops that were up on the DMZ area, like, like Don Weaver and the infantry, etc. I think the ratio is for every, for every troop on the front lines, there's 13 support troops doing various jobs, and that was what I did. Uh, our, our, uh, our branch... Our branch flag looks like this. It's a transportation flag, so I just wanted to see, show you exactly what our motto is, essentially. If we go back to the pictures, um, I could show you just quickly what the Port of Incheon looked like instead of just the map that you saw earlier. This was the Port of Incheon in 1970, 71, when I was there. Um, and you could see that it was a big, thriving thriving uh, military and civilian port that was in operation. Now, because of the 30-foot ties that I was talking about, we had to do a two-step operation. Cargo had to come off of ships onto barges and brought, into, brought in through locks, like, uh, like Port Canaveral has a lock, and brought through locks and then brought into the, uh, into the warehouse area. So it was a two-step operation, which was extremely inefficient. And ultimately, I, and ultimately, after uh, I left, the port was closed, and Pusan, as I pointed out in the earlier photo, in the earlier map, wound up being the only uh, the only location where uh, supplies would would go forward. But we operated this during the year that I was there in 1970-71. Here's an example of a scout boat that we used for doing inspections on ships out at out in the harbor, and then. Um, the next photograph is uh, yours truly on one of our 65-foot tugboats. We had four 65-foot tugboats, two 100-foot tugboats. And then the, the, the last picture that I have shows uh, a 100-ton floating crane, which we used for taking tanks, armor personnel carriers. Anything that was heavy could come off the ship with a 100-ton floating crane. So we'd pick it off the ships and put it on barges and bring it through those locks. So that essentially is is photographs of that general area, the my responsibilities that I had were port documentation officer, so I was involved in all the paperwork that was required to load ships and unload ships uh, came through my office and I was responsible for it. I was also the installation transportation officer. I was in charge of all the vehicles that went, came, and came and went to personal vehicles of personnel that were um, and in, the, in South Korea and in the, in the uh, U.S. Army. I was the customs clearance officer, so 
You came through the port, you had to get your clearance through me. Uh, that was interesting. I was a payroll officer as well, and indirectly I was involved in port operations, vessel supply, and security. So it was uh, a pretty heady job for a 23-year-old. For a I had probably 100 people working for me, and uh, we were, we were uh, half of those were Korean civilians, and uh, it, was, it was quite a, a mix of individuals and, uh, and quite a big effort. So uh, that's, that's essentially my personal story. I'll turn it back to Don and we'll talk a little about what he did. I hope you've enjoyed today's presentation. Doug, you did a fantastic job Thank of you. the history of it. Uh, I want to commend Doug, too. He is wearing the same Army uniform he wore many decades ago in Korea. My wife would laugh if he, I even tried to get mine on. So, Doug, thank you. I also want to say thanks to Paul Julian. He's our librarian here at the Veterans Memorial Center. He's doing the filming. And to Joe Davey, who is our editor, will put this thing together. We believe here at the Veterans Memorial Center and the Military Officers Association that does Vets Back to Class, Cape Canaveral chapter of that, we believe that by doing this, we make up for what we miss. Before this video, some of you will have remembered, we came into many classrooms. Over the years, more than 9,000 students in 29 Brevard schools had veterans come and visit them. We hope as COVID wanes and the shots go more, by next fall we'll be back in your class because we miss not being able to answer questions or really talk to you one-on-one. -on -one. But we hope this helps a little bit and is a good break. Thank you very much, guys. As far as I'm concerned, I just wanted to make a couple of other points. Uh, emphasize to you, I joined the Army, and I actually enlisted in the Army in 1968, just when I finished college. So I was eligible to go into an officer candidate school program, which I did, and chose the infantry, the, Army, the United States Army Infantry. I served for four more years in the military, and 44 years after that for the federal government in the Department of State. But I learned about service, I learned about discipline, I learned about organization, I learned about all the things required to lead through the military. I'm not trying to say you should join the military. I'm simply saying understand that the military does a lot for a lot of Americans. And uh, I hope that as you talk to your, your grandparents or your great-grandparents, if they're still here with us, thank them for their service. Uh, and thank you, those of you who are the children of active duty members, we have 13,000 in Brevard County, thank you and your parents for your service. You're in the military too. I ended up uh, retiring down here to Cocoa Beach where I had grown up in, uh, in uh, 2013 and now I'm chairman of the Brevard Veterans Council and work in a few other committees and jobs here on a voluntary basis. So once again, have a good rest of your day and God bless the United States of America.